Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today's video is going to be a tiny bit different from the stuff I usually release on this channel in that I am going to focus on a piece of test gear that I got. This video is sponsored by Keysight and as I teased in the last video, they provided me with this amazing new scope. I actually was looking for a DSO digital storage oscilloscope for quite a while, but they are rather expensive. So when they contacted me about a gear for promotion deal, I didn't really hesitate for that long. And in return, I'm going to focus on this oscilloscope today and on the Keysight University Live event that they have coming up. There is a link in the video description where you can sign up for this event. There's massive amounts of test gear to be won. And there's going to be a lot of videos on the Keysight YouTube channel, interviews with all kinds of experts. I am not an expert at all, disclaimer. <laughs> I'm actually experiencing one. I am not worthy moment after another with this scope. So yeah, I hope this is still going to be interesting because I know a lot of you keep asking about my lab stuff here and my test gear. And I'm just going to try to figure out some of the things that this scope can do and how it differs from my old analog scopes. And I hope this is going to be interesting for at least some of you. There's going to be more retro computer videos very soon on this channel. Consider this kind of a bonus video focusing on this machine. So here it is in all its glory. It's the Keysight DSO X1204G. The G means it has a signal generator built in, which is really handy actually, because otherwise you would have to have an external signal generator in case you want to feed some signal into some circuit. This is one of the entry level models actually, but it's the fully fletched out version of their entry level scope. So it can do 200 megahertz at two giga samples. Most of the stuff I work on has a couple of megahertz uh, frequencies at the most. So this is pretty much overkill for this channel, but it's going to come in handy when measuring ripple on switching power supplies and stuff like that, which often has a higher frequency than the machines I work on. So this is not going to be a full review or anything like that. It's just me tinkering with this and figuring out some of the things that it can do. I have used this but I haven't really looked into all the special features this has at all. So join me on this adventure, <laughs> I guess, of figuring out this uh, new scope. It's pretty tiny, actually. It's uh, 31 centimeters wide and it's 11 or thereabouts centimeters deep. And it is 16 or so centimeters high. It's a relatively small device which uh, suits my very small lab here massively well because I can just have this set up all the time. I usually uh, put it on here below my screen there and that's really handy to have a scope that I can just turn on and measure things with which already makes this worthwhile for me. Uh, with the analog scopes, you usually have like a big box thing that you have to put somewhere. And I was really struggling with uh, getting the pictures from the scope into the videos and uh, worked with dual camera setups and things like that. I'm still going to do dual camera setups with this, but I have all my tinkering space free and still have a scope in reach, which is really cool. One thing that struck me as massively different from my regular analog scopes, of course, is that this thing needs to boot up the software, actually. So I'm turning this on. It's nice and rainbowy. And then it takes a while until it is actually usable. That's something that totally is all right, because obviously this has uh, the software on there that it needs to boot. It's basically a computer. So not like the analog scopes that are just an electron beam. Uh, that's deflected by some coils. This is really doing much of its magic in software, so it needs some time. As you can see, it takes a couple of seconds, I think, uh, yeah, 30 seconds or 40 seconds to boot up. And then it's instantly usable. So yeah, there we go. Now it's usable. This has a little fan in it for cooling, actually, and it's not completely silent, but it's 
pretty silent, so it's not really disturbing me in any way. I don't know if you can hear it. You might be able to hear it in the background. Just a pretty pleasing uh, sound. <laughs> it's, it's a nice frequency even, so that's not disturbing me much when I have this running. So this has a nice clear and bright screen and you can still see it in the sunlight. Actually, you can also adjust the brightness. This isn't a touch screen. That's for the higher tier models, I think. But it has these uh, menu buttons that can have various things assigned to them. All these knobs actually can be pushed in. And yeah, these feel just like the analog controls, basically. You can set the horizontal and the vertical. And uh, I don't have the Pro hooked up to anything at the moment, so you can ch change the position. One really handy thing is that you can reset the position by just pushing the knob in for the position, so that's cool. You have math functions you can uh, add and uh, do all kinds of things, divide the different inputs from each other. You have, actually you have an FFT analysis built in, which is a really handy feature for audio stuff as well as figuring out where some disturbances of the force are in circuits and things like that. We see some spikes here that are just uh, from the probe floating freely here. And yeah, it's just all around so much more powerful than the analog stuff I was using previously. This actually has a really nice demo mode built in that you can access by putting the probe on channel 1 onto this demo terminal here. And uh, yeah, it's located in the help menu here. And there's all kinds of neat little demos that uh, show off the capabilities of the scope. This just points out that it has a higher refresh rate than other scopes. This is uh, a different scope. It's simulating a lesser scope now, <laughs> so you can't see all the times the wave flickers there. It's really cool. Uh, the signal generator is actually really useful. Can you do um, sine waves, square waves, triangle waves, ramp pulse waves, DC, noise, <laughs> Amplitude modulated signals. This is a CAN bus signal. That's pretty amazing that it has. And it's actually generating the signals. So um, this is actually the signal generator generating the signals it's showing. This is an example of a serial bus being probed. And you can clearly make out the single pulses here. That's pretty amazing. So I'm going to exit the demo mode. <laughs> And it has some very sophisticated training capabilities as well. This is the menu for all the, the trainings that you can have. And you can just go through the menus by turning this little entry knob and then pushing it down. You can have a sine wave with a glitch shown here. And in this mode you actually have to do all the settings yourself. That's why it's called training mode. <laughs> I wanted the sign with the glitch. This has a really great auto scale feature. And there you can see uh, the sine wave that has a little glitch there. So that means there's some signal on there. This is just a simulation, obviously. But if I would see this sine wave and it was supposed to be a sine wave, then I would clearly see that there's something wrong. <laughs> You can basically do all the things you can do with an analog scope as well. And you have the run stop button here, which you can just stop what you're seeing on screen and zoom in and all kinds of fancy things, which of course is a massively handy feature for when you are exploring buses on old computers in my case and things like that. So you can really see the single uh, signals there. Also, obviously, this is a four-channel scope. My previous scopes were both two-channel scopes, so this is a massive upgrade for me. And actually, you can change the color for each trace, and you can basically do whatever you want to each individual trace through the menus. Uh, these buttons here are to switch on the other traces. 
very nicely color coded. So I now have the signal generator, which is this button here, activated and I have just hooked up a BNC cable from the generator out to channel 1 on the scope. So yeah, you can set this to all kinds of things. Um, actually, you can of course change the frequency, things like that. Uh, yeah, it's like this. 100, 1000 hertz. So, and we can change the amplitude, obviously. Which is really cool for uh, using this with audio equipment too. And can do 12 volt peak to peak output. <laughs> Which of course would be a bit high for audio equipment. Uh, but this could also generate a nice test signal for all kinds of things. It can do square waves, of course. Um, the ramps, which is a triangle wave. Pulses, we can uh, change everything. It can generate a DC signal as well. And it can generate a noise signal. So this is going to be very useful for a lot of use cases, actually. We can add noise to the signal, that's pretty neat. Oh, what a noisy sine wave! It's simulating noise too. <laughs> okay, I want a clean signal. And yeah, as you can see, the signal is pretty clean. Uh, in this... We should center it again. So, yeah, and you can just, you can basically just stop this and uh, then work with the acquired signal, which is this little signal we have here. We can explore the waveform in more detail in case we want to look at some distortion going on there or something like that, which is of course amazing. Well, that's obviously a very small fraction of the things that this scope can do. You can also hook it up with an Ethernet cable to a modern computer and have access to some of the controls it has. You can take screenshots via a web interface that this actually provides. You can also take screenshots via a USB stick that you stick into the front panel there. There's a USB port there that's also useful for powering probes that need an external power supply. What I'm going to do now is to take a look at how I am going to use this scope. And as you probably know, I'm primarily working on vintage computers. So I'm just getting out a vintage computer board and trying some of my usual steps using the new capabilities of this scope. Keysight have the Keysight University live event coming up. This online event for engineers features tips, tricks and prizes that will make you an engineering legend. Enter now for a free early entry and tune in March 15th for daily chances to learn and win test gear. And there's actually going to be very informative videos with very little corporate messaging in them. So I recommend checking that out. Learn tips and tricks here from industry experts and get a sneak peek at never before seen test gear. You could also win more than $300,000 worth of oscilloscope RF and bench equipment. You don't want to miss this. Tune into the Keysight University Live homepage and the Keysight Labs YouTube channel for the day one live stream on March 15 to get started now. The links are all in the video description. Check them out. So I have a C64 board set up here, connected to a power supply and connected to my monitor. And I'm going to probe around on this for a bit. Uh, this one got donated by Bart and he didn't know if this was okay, but it actually works. So it's a working Commodore 64. It's missing the SID chip. Otherwise this is a stock Commodore 64 revision 4 250469 board. And I have a two camera setup set up here with a phone pointing at the scope actually. So. Let's get probing, I guess. <laughs> so for now I have the scope probe hooked up to the crystal oscillator. And as you can see, we see a nice sine wave there that is not very high voltage. It's uh, 964 millivolts peak to peak. And I'm just going to hook up another second probe. 
Yeah, and uh, now I'm probing the 8701 chip that has the same signal, but it's offset, it seems. Or do I have to ground this probe as well? Let's try that. No, it's clearly offset. That's interesting. And it's also delayed a bit, it seems, which is also something I didn't really know. So obviously this chip, it's nearly inverted. Oh, and actually I'm now controlling the amplitude of the selected channel only, which is the green channel. That's pretty nifty. So I can have this in relation to the other channel. These are ground. That's the ground line, the center line there. And I've activated the little uh, auto cursors here, which you can set to different units. This is set to megahertz now and it's detecting 8.3 megahertz and 964 volts, millivolts peak to peak on the, uh, directly from the oscillator. Let's poke around some more. I'm actually deactivating the first channel now. And these are the ch uh, signals on the VIC-2 chip. And we can just stop them and take a closer look and you can actually see stuff happening there. It's going from a low, which is close to zero, to high. Yeah, that's cool. So we have all the signals here very clearly visible. Yeah, and that's just... And actually, if I take the probe away, it actually keeps the picture, of course, if I stop it. <laughs> Something I need to get used to. Yeah, this is, I think, the timing signal, and then I slipped. That is actually the feature I was after, really, just the, the basic storage oscilloscope uh, facility of just uh, stopping this and taking a shot, a screenshot of the waveform, and you can scroll through it and look at it in detail. And this also has a very handy feature of just magnifying parts of the parts of the trays here, which you can access by pushing this little magnifier button. That is really cool. Okay. <laughs> ah. Yeah, this is for, for future repairs. This is going to be so handy. Yeah, this is a working C64, so it would probably be better off by uh, probing something that's not working. This is the CPU, actually. There's some activity. Let's see. This is, I guess, a data bus. I don't have the pinout handy now. You can actually see the individual bits. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, and this, this is what I would see on the, on the analog scope, basically. So you can see that there's activity, and you can see how well the voltages match what you expect on a pin like this. But just uh, being able to stop this and zoom in and have, yeah, and see the individual highs and lows and measure. That's so cool. Okay. Yeah, this is going to be mostly what I use this for, I guess. Do we still have our signal in comparison here? Yeah, we do. <laughs> There's our crystal oscillator signal. And you can see you can have different settings for the individual channels here, which is, of course, a feature that was already uh, present in the analog scopes and the better ones. But that's, yeah, it's just massively cool to be able to zoom in on individual things there. Yeah, you can actually see how things are timed by the clock. This is just the oscillator and uh, the timings are always relative to the oscillator, obviously. In a working system. And there's a little, a tiny bit of delay, but you can still see how they correspond, I guess. It all makes sense now. And of course you can do this with four channels at once. There's also an acquisition mode where you can set this to acquire data only as long as there's data and then just automatically stop. 
and you have a nice still frame that you can work by. This is really handy. Oh, there's actually some communication. This is the, the ROM, the basic and kernel ROM, which is combined on these machines. That is so cool. That actually looks a bit strange because we have high and then we have higher still. It doesn't look quite right, but the machine works, so yeah. Maybe there's something wonky with this machine after all. I haven't really, really tested this in detail. I have to get used to pushing this uh, run-stop button. That's another massively cool feature because it has a run-stop button, just like the Commodore 64. So I would love this thing even without using it, just for the run-stop button in the corner. <laughs> So that's, that's the things I want to do with this, really, just be able to use it as a storage. Pretty basic functionality, I know, and this is pretty much overkill. But, yeah, there's also going to be some nice things with the math functions that you can do to have, like, timings in relation and inverse one or add to each other. That's going to be really handy as well. Of course, this can do massively more than this and it also has which is a really nice feature if you get things messed up in the settings you can always put this back into the default setup which is pretty handy of course if you are like me and try fiddling with things in sub menus <laughs> and then don't remember how well yeah and you can put the this has like a simulated trace intensity as well can just turn that down. I'll leave it on 50% for now. This is just going to be pretty handy for a lot of things I do. Actually, this makes me feel more confident to work on some of the machines that I gave up on because I can look at things in more detail now. Not that I'm that much of an expert still, but yeah, this is going to make things significantly easier, even for a noob like me, who doesn't really know his electronics, but is uh, self-taught for the vast majority of my half-knowledge. Still, this is going to be massively useful for me. Let's try a single-shot thing here. Yeah, single-shot mode just basically allows you to step through the waveform here and you can still zoom in and out and look at the individual shots. You can, of course, you can change the trigger mode for the single shot stuff as well. That makes sense if you have single events coming up here. Maybe let's check some, some more menus out. What can it do? Quick actions. The quick action has not been configured. Oh, you can, you can actually set this button up to do whatever you want. If you have a recurring thing that you always do. Nice. Yeah, these are the trigger modes. You can set this up to reject more noise even and things like that. So it doesn't trigger on noise. Triggers on the edge, which is I think what I want. Ah, it can do a whole bunch of things there. It can, yeah, it has video trigger modes, which is something that the old scopes have as well. Of course, because they were used to repair television sets and stuff like that. Can do this on this one too. That's cool. So it has all the features the old scopes have, but so much more. And the cursors are actually really cool because you can, uh, you can have it auto-read the frequencies and uh, the voltages and things like that. And you can, yeah, you can change the units around. I have set this to hertz and to volts because it makes the most sense for my use cases here. That was just a small glimpse, of course, of what this scope is able to do. I am not the best person to explain these modern DSOs to anybody, so I'm just happy that I have this now. Thanks so much, Keysight, for providing me with this. I also hope you enjoyed this video, even if it was kind of a commercial kind of thing. I am going to do more videos about my lab gear, though, eventually, because I get a lot of questions from you 
about what tools I actually use. To say that again, I'm completely self-taught, so none of the stuff I use is necessarily the best thing. It's just things that work for me. And this scope is going to serve me well for future repairs. So you are going to see this scope in future episodes getting a lot of views probably. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to that. Thanks for watching. Thanks everybody who supports my channel. Thanks Keysight. Hope you remember to check out their event. The links are in the video description. And I hope to see you on this channel again for more retro computer stuff and more vintage hi-fi repairs and things like that. The regular programming on this channel is a bit different. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I'm Elbeta. See you next time. Bye.